Hello class and welcome to the session. We'll continue on unit six with the applications of electronics. Let's look at our syllabus and uh, we'll come back to understanding them in a practical sense with applications pertaining to our syllabus. In that unit six, we see that we have we covered uh, triple five timers in the previous session, which was accidentally named as unit five. And uh, in this session, we'll start talking about a block diagram and working off welding control circuit, a sequential timer, and temperature control circuit using SCR, forward speed control circuit, level control circuit using variable and variable capacitors and potentiometers. There's nothing called um, level control circuit using variable capacitors and potentiometers. But uh, level control circuit separately, yes, I will talk about variable, variable capacitors and potentiometers in its application and how it can be related to electronics. But there's nothing uh, that I could explain in terms of level control circuit using a variable capacitor and a potentiometer. Yes, with further, without further ado, let's go into the subject. Let's start with welding. When you look at welding transformers in the market, you will see them in various says, shapes and sizes. But in this session, we're going to look at it in one aspect of identifying exactly uh, what is it that is required for us to understand out of these transformers. Let's look at uh, its working. The most fundamental design of a welding transformer is understanding the concept that energy cannot be created nor be destroyed, but can be changed from one form to another in an equivalent proportion. In other words, if I have dissipated power in my primary coil of my transformer, in other words, if current flows and there's a voltage across it, that voltage into current is power. I have dissipated power. I can't destroy it. That has now become a magnetic flux and that flows through the core. And when that flux goes into the secondary coil, you would have an EMF induced. And that combined with inductance of the circuit is power that cannot be destroyed. Now, this, looking at the circuit, you see that it's a step-down transformer. In other words, I have high voltage, now I have low voltage. I have low current here, I would have high current here. In other words, uh, I could have 24 into 1, 24 volt, 1 amp is 24. I can have 1 volt, 24 amps, still 24 watt. So understanding that voltage and current, a product of it is power. So the energy dissipator on the primary is transferred in the secondary. We're not considering losses at this time, but let's understand the concept as, as this. So I could have just one volt here, but the current is 24 amps, which is the same power that came here as 24 watt, but it's, and in reality, it's much higher. And that current is now sent across a weld piece. Now I have my base plate here and I have my welding, welding electrode there. What happens? The moment I close the circuit, a current starts flowing. The, the reactance of the circuit drops, current starts flowing in the primary, current is flowing through the secondary. Now, and the secondary current is going across the circuit now because it's close to the circuit or the soft circuit. In case I create a gap in the circuit and I separate it, an arc is formed. To understand an arc, let's go back to understand the practical aspects of a flywheel. Back to the fundamental. Now, you remember the flywheel. We saw a flywheel and I said that it could store current. If I spin it up, it continues to flow, run in the same direction after the input power which, that was a spin was interrupted. It continues to spin. Now, in a similar, similar way, if an arc is formed, even after the power is taken off, it will continue to flow even if there's no conductive material in that place. For example, there was an air gap. That air gap has air in it and is considered to be an insulator. But since you have this voltage applied there, that voltage would ionize the air and form an arc and bridge it across the gap and that arc will have the ability to flow a current through the air even after the current, I mean even after the current, I mean the voltage has created a gap across the insulating material air, the air will break down, air starts conducting. That air forms an arc and that arc has resistance because compared to the conductor of conductivity of air, and come back to connect you to the, the copper electrode or the electrode or the conductive wire, it would be have a higher resistance and that power dissipated would be really high, which would cause a lot of heat. In this case, now it's desirable and that heat will melt metal. And the amount of light that you get 
it's pretty bright too and that arc is called an arc from an electrode so this is a basic function of, an, uh, of a transformer now you could have transformers that work with dc which have switching circuits and you also have transformers that work with ac power supply so this is a typical circuit for an ac operated transformer now let's look at a dc operated transformer let's look at the circuit this is a typical dc transformer so what where do i get this dc power source from in this in most cases when you look at welding transformers they overload the power supply and you would have fluctuation in the power supply that disturbs other appliances connected on the same line this is avoided when you have power stored in a battery or a capacitor bank a capacitor bank is like a battery for an instant and that power this is a symbol for an SCR, silicon control rectifier, and they connected an anti parallel so they can connect in both positive and reverse direction. So, this is a circuit of an inverter, and they're feeding power to the primary of a transformer, as we saw in AC welding machine. Now, this you also have transformers, and the secondary power is rectified with these three phase rectifiers and fed across to an arc. Yeah, so I have a DC source, I have a transformer. So this way of using a DC power supply to avoid interruption or surges in the power supply is what DC transformers or DC welding machines are good at. So you still have your inverter. It does not operate on the frequencies that you normally operate, like 50 hertz. It might have a higher frequency. But the beautiful part is it does not cause surges in your power supply since your power is stored in a small battery or a capacitor bank before being fed into your inverter and your transformer system before it's rectified and fed into your arc system to have an arc produced um, which is really strong intense but what we saw earlier and so that was an ac arc this is a dc arc to be able to weld metals together it could be a spot welder it could be a run weld on metal and the melting point of metal you know it it's pretty high in thousands of degrees uh, thousands of degrees my time sometimes and it does reach those temperatures very easily because the power cannot be destroyed yes now let's look at the next understanding of the topic understanding what makes up an arc in this case we have a 2000 volt power supply i am sending this 2000 volt to a 2 mega ohm resistor and into a 10 nanofarad high voltage capacitor so what happens this voltage this capacitor gets charged up through this resistor and the voltage is strong enough across this gap instead of flowing through the capacitor the the uh, arc is formed across this arc gap and flows through. In other words, you look at the waveform. The voltage keeps rising. The moment it reaches about 2,000 volts, 1,000 volts, it breaks across this barrier and then a current flows. And that moment the current flows, the, the voltage drops again, it starts building up voltage charge again. So this, can you see it? it every few instances you can see the uh, current flow through this arc gap. This is a spark. So to initiate such a spark for welding machines, you have a separate circuit that could help start the welding machine and get it going so this is how such a circuit works now to generate this uh, spark the most common thing that you might have heard about are these high voltage flaring um, systems that can generate sparks for you let's look at one such it's called um let's call it here let's generate a spark you can use the same software and try to generate your own Look up a uh, different simulation a spark gap using a Tesla coil. A Tesla coil is what was used by Nikola Tesla to generate high voltage uh, in his lab. So every cycle of your AC power supply, there's, a, there's an oscillation that happens. The power that's being stored in this capacitor breaks this air gap, and that oscillated power feeds back and keeps it oscillating until it dampens out and it starts charging in the reverse direction now. So for every cycle, you have two sparks that fly across this gap. So there are many ways to generate it, but the only thing is this requires too many transformers and capacitors to have this circuit realized, but the voltages that you can generate are really, really high. In this case, like about 10,000 volts. Early we saw about 2,000 volts. Here it's about 10,000. Can you see the voltage building up? It's about 600, 700. Let's increase the simulation speed a little more. You see it's going to 800, 1,000. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 5, it'll go all the way to um, 10 kilovolt before it breaks across per cycle. So this power that's being dissipated in the primary is being stored. In other words, it's like storing water in a bucket and using it all of a, all of a sudden in an instant. So that's how this system, so it's gone about a 7.6 volt negative voltage, 8, 9, 
and it goes to 10, you would have a spark across the gap and the circuit oscillates and it goes back to the next cycle. Now it's charging a negative, you can see it red, it's negative, it goes all the way to 10 kilovolt, the spark gap continues. So this is another simple ex example of how you could use to generate a spark to get a spark welding machine or a, a spark for a high voltage generated in a real time environment using electronic controls of using basic components like resistors, capacitors, inductors with transformers. Now, this is an interesting circuit. This is the next topic, actually. It's sequential circuits. In other words, this is a sequential circuit. You might say, where do I need to have a sequential circuit? I'll explain it to you. For example, um, I, now here, the output is high, the input is high, the output is low. I give a trigger, I made it low, and that shifts stage by stage to the next stage. Example, this goes low, this goes low, this goes low, and goes low. So, and, and you can see the circuit, in other words, can you see the outputs, it's chain stage? Now this, can you see this is dark gray, which means it's low. So it changes and goes high. The voltage across this is the isolating capacitor. So you have, this will go high, this will go high, this will go high. <coughs> we'll reach the feed, the next circuit again. So let's look at it. So, since it's across a capacitor, it'll go high, this will go high, this will go high in a sequence. So I give my input, high, 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 it goes back to stop. In other words, I have a time cycle. Like, like we saw earlier, we saw using a triple five IC in a sequential controller where we had the shift happening with an IC and we were able to control traffic lights. Similar application. For example, let's look at it with a realistic application. Yeah, I start a machine with a start button. The first stage triggers the second stage, which is a forward operation. The second stage triggers the stop operation. The third stage triggers the reverse operation. Reverse operation, a stop operation. So this sequential control is what is possible with such controls. In other words, one stage controls the next stage. The input is here. This output controls this input. This output controls the next input. This output controls the next input. So you have stage by stage. So in other words, we saw the same circuit in operation. I give a trigger, hit the start button, it runs in forward, then it runs and stops, it runs in reverse, then again it runs, it stops. So all this happens in a sequential circuit. For example, I want to time a control. It might not just be one second, it could be, it might be minutes. It might be a time required to bottle one, uh, maybe time required to bottle uh, a, a, a pack of juice maybe. So um, running the pump, um, moving the conveyor to the forward direction, coming back and picking back the next bottle. So it's a forward, reverse, stop. All this process is a sequential control and such controllers are capable of doing it. It's called sequential control. So in other words, your power supply goes to the motor, these switch for first stage, running it in forward, second stage for stripping it and stopping it. And all this is done in a sequential control, running, operating these relays, these relays in turn control the motor. So the sequential controller, typical application yes now let's look at another application with a triple five IC you might have not heard the sound when you hear a police siren or a vehicle run across you and the sound is two frequencies first you have a low frequency like about 300 Hertz in this case then you have a 660 Hertz how does how do I hear two sounds in other words this oscillators two triple five IC oscillators are cascaded and one generate one in one condition it generates a 300 hertz output which is going to the speaker here in the second condition it generates a 600 hertz higher frequency so you had high frequency low frequency high low high low and the DDA sound that you're talking about that is a sound that a simple triple five IC two ICs together can generate now where do I need to have why could I use it in a smaller scale is it really a triple five that's doing it the truth is these circuits are so so small that you might have them in your small table I mean, tabletop alarm clock on your table for example remember the beep sound on your alarm clock in the morning you hear the beep sound it's like beep 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 beep, beep, beep. so i hear four beeps a gap for about four beeps and again four beeps the truth is there are three different cascaded stages of oscillators the first one that generates the beep sound, the pee constant sound, yes? The second oscillator, and cascaded to it, interrupts the first uh, high frequency output as 
beeps. In other words, beep, 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 beep. So it's second oscillator. Device lets the speaker uh, speaker get that high frequency, but does not get it continuously. It breaks it up into interval intervals. So instead of getting continuous beep, it's, it's an annoying noise. I break it down into inter intervals. I'm not. If you want to understand exactly what kind of a speaker I'm talking about, you might have seen these kind of small buzzers in your alarm uh, clock that makes a high-pitched annoying noise. Those are the ones I'm talking about. This is a buzzer. I'll be talking about that in how does it work with cascaded circuits. So, so the first circuit might be generating a high frequency, let's say a, a two kilohertz. The second one might interrupt it, might be like, uh, you know, interrupt it. So instead of getting a constant beep, you have beep, 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 beep. And now the third circuit, let's four beeps go through and mutes four beeps. Again, let's four beeps go through and mutes four beeps. This third circuit combined, cascaded, having the same input coming in, it's the high frequency operating the buzzer can generate a sequence which is part of cascading. So understanding it practically is more important than understanding it theoretically. So the applications are vast. The truth is, if you remember your alarm clock, it's not very big. It's a small blob uh, that you see on your circuit board. Under that small blob, there's a small semiconductor. Inside that semiconductor, all this happens. So when the trigger time happens, all these three circuits work together and generates the sound that you hear that wakes you up in the morning until you go hit the snooze or turn the alarm off. Okay, now the next, next topic we're going to talk about is how I can use a semiconductor to operate, um, in this case, let's say, a switch. For example, I want to control temperature. So when you want to control temperature in a furnace, I want to control temperature in uh, an oven. I can use electronics. For example, I have my controller and I set, set the temperature as say uh, 80 degrees and I turn the oven on. How does it know exactly when to turn off at 80 degrees? Now look at this small temperature controller. So you have a small display. You have your buttons to program it. You have a small relay. You have your power supply and your control line to control your heater. And you also have your temperature probe that you can identify to measure what temperature you want to measure. This temperature controller does not have an SCR. Instead, it has a small transistor that drives a relay, and the relay drives your heating element. Instead, I could use an SCR. And that's SCR is what I was talking about this picture here. This is a Fotec um, SCR based solid state relay. So it's, it's a relay. Like a relay, it can control a high temperature, isolated, electrically isolated, but it's called a solid state relay. In other words, this small example, I have a microcontroller. Microcontroller can generate a small 5 volt signal or low voltage signal. So this can support an input of 3 volt to 32 volt DC. Using the small 3 volt or 5 volt input, I can control a 24 volt or all the way up to 380 volt AC power supply, completely isolated. So when I have a circuit of this kind, and I want to say, Turn on the oven, or at well, I mean in a particular temperature, it's time to it's the temperature is going too low. I can use such a circuit. Now, where do I have a need to control it, and what does it look like in an industry? When I go to an industry, what should I look for? I'll show you a temp industrial grade temperature controller. This is what an industrial grade temperature controller looks like. This is a select uh, PID temperature controller. In other words, it's got a PID loop running inside it proportional integral and derivative loop inside to be able to control the temperature. So you have the set temperature and you have the real temperature and until the set point comes it keeps on heating it up or before the set point is exceeded it controls the temperature by turning on and off your heating element. So that turning on and off can be a relay like this kind which is currently inside this board or as I showed you earlier the solid state relay. I can use a solid state relay to turn on and off the temperature, the, the heater and in turn controls the temperature. So this would be the brain of the circuit, but the real work of handling the heavy current would be done by the solid state relay. Yes, so this is an understanding of how you could use electronics. Now let's look at another thing. You need to understand the fundamentals. When I talk about pressure, it's like talking about voltage in an electrical circuit. It doesn't matter the, look at this diagram here, it doesn't matter the width of the tank. It's the height of the tank that talks about the voltage. So, when I talk about a capacitor, it's not about 
at what voltage am I charging it up to? It doesn't talk about the capacity of the capacitor. It doesn't talk about the farad. It's what, what voltage I've charged it up to. The bigger the tank, it'll take me a lot more time to fill it up. The smaller the tank, it'll fill up much faster. Earlier, we talked about the spring and how I can use it to understand how a capacitor works. This is your need. This is something important. Okay. Now, the height, it might be one feet or three feet or 10 feet, but the height of the water column is 10 feet. The pressure is about 4.3 PSI, pounds of force per square inch of area. Okay, why talking about this? The reason is, we're talking about a capacitor. Can I vary the capacity of a capacitor? Why should I talk about varying the capacity of a capacitor? We talk about, remember it, we talked about an inductor and a capacitor and a circuit. And when I combine it together, I can store energy. We talked about the simple harmonic motion. We talked about simple harmonic motion. We're talking about kinetic energy and potential energy and how a spring and an inductor can work together to oscillate that natural frequency. So if I want to change the frequency that it's oscillating at, I should be able to either change the value of the inductor the amount of energy it stores as current or it should be able to change the value of the capacitor the amount of energy that it can store as a potential or charge in the case of a capacitor and such a way of changing it is available in radio circuits especially this is an old vintage vacuum tube radio which has a variable capacitor let's look at another picture of it this is what it looks like so if you remember the fundamentals of capacitors capacitors is two different materials but I mean, in other words, two different metal, I have two conductor materials separated by an insulator. So, in this case, I could have plastic, I could use mica, or you could use air. If you remember your tuner in your radio, you keep turning it. What are you turning? You're actually changing the value of the, capac the capacitor to change the frequency of oscillation to be able to tune from one frequency to another. In other words, I'm listening to a particular frequency. I want to change to another frequency so that I can listen to another channel. I change the value of capacitance. So this is a very common phenomena in terms of understanding how you can change it is by changing the layers, number of, the amount of area it's going to overlap. The more area, more capacitance. Less area, less capacitance. Understanding that is about how variable capacitance work. There's another thing that you can always, uh, you always see in... Um, circuits especially when understanding measurements i can measure position of this uh, position of this rotor by understanding the capacitance of the circuit and say that the position of the rotor but the most common thing that you would see is variable resistors in this case i have two potentiometers they're exactly not potentiometers they're presets so it's a variable resistor i can have its value change from zero to maximum but the most common shape you might see is this shape it might be an amplifier it might be a speed control for your fan these are the variable resistors. In other words, it's, a, it's a, now I'm talking about a capacitor resistance circuit for controlling the time it requires to charge up a capacitor or an inductor capacitor circuit, the time it takes for a capacitor, the, the circuit, the frequency at which it oscillates, I should be able to vary a component. So in the case of a, I'm, it's an input component, input device, and I want to value the value, change the value of resistance, I use a potentiometer. It's a variable resistor. You also have variable resistors in different forms. They talked about this as a variable resistor as an input. Remember this light sensor? It's called an LDR, light dependent resistor. Even this is a variable resistor. This resistor has its resistance value changed based on the amount of light that falls on it. If I block the light falling on it, this resistance goes up, light falls on it, resistance goes down. It's as simple as that. So resistance is a variable value. So variable resistor could be a light based dependent, Temperature dependent in the case of this probe. So this is a temperature dependent resistor. So what I'm measuring here, resistance. So understanding how semiconductors can be used is a very important factor of understanding the practical aspects of engineering. So this is applied versions of electronics. So a light dependent resistor, a temperature dependent, dependent resistor, a position dependent resistor, another one that's position dependent. In other words, this I can change multiple times. It's meant to be tuned. And this is one that's called preset. In other words, you set it once and you leave it there. It's a variable resistor that can hold its position for time. So uh, let's talk about another topic. We talked about transformers earlier. And I talked about energy can never be created nor destroyed, but can move from one form to another in equivalent proportion. 
we have we saw this 5 amp 12 volt transformer 1202 so in other words can be a 24 volt transformer also uh, depending if i take the first and last wire and also talked about i showed you another transformer which i have which is a huge power amplifiers transformer which is was taken from a sony um, home theater system kind of it's really heavy so these transformers are inductive in nature so they can store current just like this fire flywheel so you talked about welding can i do welding with these transformers the answer is yes you can do welding you can even weld silicon steel laminations that are used in these transformers using the power that's available out of these transformers so can i make your own can you make, make your own welding machine of course you can even make your own spot welding machine or even a bigger one using transformers so it's all about the number of turns in the primary and secondary it's all about how much of power you're being dissipating in the primary. You can't destroy that energy. It will get dissipated on the secondary. If you can't destroy energy, the simplest thing that happens, it gets hot. It could be eddy current heat. It could be resistance-based heat. It could be any form of heat. And that heat, in the case of welding, is desirable. In the case of a transformer, if it's getting too hot, it's not desirable. So you need to cool it down. It can either be cooled in water or could, I mean, sorry, cooled in air, or it could be cooled in oil which is a non-conductor material so that it can be cooled down and not destroyed in the process. So let's understand a little more topics in terms of how you can understand engineering practically and its application to electronics. Okay, let's look at this topic in reference to speed control. So what is speed control for a circuit? Can I use an SCR for speed control? The answer is yes. Let's look at it in a practical aspect. Here I have a tank frame, uh, I mean, you could call it a toy, you could call it a project. So I have a motor which can operate all, maybe up to 12 volt and I have a speed controller. What is in the speed controller? So it's a small IC, integrated circuit, which is a bridge, hedge bridge controller, which is capable of controlling the mot motor speed and direction by controlling the SCRs inside it. So what is an SCR? As we know, I talked about it earlier, it's a silicon control rectifier. So what happens is, I control the power supply, the voltage going to this, and the polarity of the voltage going to it. In other words, if it's plus and minus, it might run forward. If it's minus and plus, the motor would run reverse. So if I want to uh, control this tank forward, I give it plus and minus. If I want to run it in reverse, I control minus and plus. If I want to stop it, I cut the voltage to the motor. And if I want to run it slower, maybe I applied over 3 volt to it. If I want to make it run a little faster, maybe I apply 6 volts to it. If I want to make it run an even faster, 9 volts, maybe I want to run at full speed, 12 volt. So all this control is done with speed control. So this typical circuit is a speed controller that could be used in the field of electronics. So you'd have your, it has, it's, I mean, it, it's designed to work with such motors. And it, it can, maybe it can work on a bigger motor. This can handle up to 2 amps of current. So if you want to talk about a motor like what we talked about, the high pressure pump, Want to control its speed to control the pressure this would be able to do it provided the load is not more than two amps if you need to have a current more than two amps then you might have to think about another system that can handle the kind of currents yes so this is another application of electronics electronics is designed with a hedge bridge hedge bridge is four diodes connected in, in anti-parallel to be able to control the direction of current forward and reverse and the voltage based on pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation is how long is it on, how long is it off, and we talked about UT cycles, controlling exactly that to be able to control the RMS value, root mean squared value of the voltage applied to the motor to be able to control its direction and speed without damaging it. And this gets its input from my microcontroller maybe or from my remote uh, control in my hand to be able to control its speed and direction. So this is a typical application of how electronics can be used in modern day appliances. There's another side of electronics that I want you to understand and not take for granted. For example, you have a wireless mouse and a wireless mouse has a small receiver that comes along with it. You plug it into your computer or your phone and this can establish a connection with this mouse and work perfectly fine. How does it work? It works on a frequency called 2.4 gigahertz. In other words, we talked about clock cycles earlier. So the clock required to run this is 2.4 gigahertz. And the frequency is not fixed. It's called frequency hopping. 2.4 to 2.48 gigahertz sometimes. And that is how a wireless mouse works. Now the range is pretty good, about 20, 10 meters, and it operates a very low power. So pretty, pretty much you can run it endlessly on a wireless. And it has got decent range. 
And another thing you talk about is these dongles. These are not very popular these days, but the truth is it's got the same technology that your cell phone has in communicating with the three. If it's a 4G dongle, it might communicate with 4G. If it's got a 5G dongle, it can communicate with 5G. It's just, in other words, it's just a protocol. So you put your SIM card inside it and it can establish a connection and not talk about voice calling, only data communication, all the way from here to a tower that's 50 kilometers away and be able to help you transfer data from your computer through this USB port and through and the data information is being controlled by the SIM card which is provided by a network operator in this case it's an Atel locked SIM card so it will work only with Atel SIM cards and there's an IME number just like a phone and all the technology talk about phones it's only the data communication part of it and the protocols required for letting that happen happens with such a small dongle the other one I want to talk about is the Internet of Things Applied electronics doesn't stop without the Internet of Things. This is a IoT board. You might have seen it, might not have seen it. It's called the Microsoft Azure Sphere, designed by designed in collaboration with Microsoft. Microsoft is investing now in hardware. The reason being, the future is Internet, and you'll be able to control things. So this is your brain of your system. In other words, it communicates with the Microsoft server remotely securely it's difficult to hack into it it's got its own mac address can you see the small silver color strip that's your ceramic antenna that's an antenna that can work in on 2.4 or 5 gigahertz and has a range to be able to connect to a wi-fi or connect to the internet through that antenna and in case you want to extend it antenna there's a small port there you can connect an external antenna to it and be able to communicate uh, using external antenna so all this is possible with the development of electronics so you also have a small brain here so we talked about chips earlier. These chips have become even more smaller. So this chip would be an equivalent of a chip that was years ago so big. And that has now become so small. So we talked about transistors, we talked about resistors, capacitors, all those I can't now touch with my hand. They're really, really small and on this board right here. So this is the size of modern electronics. Size has become smaller. You have a six pin IC here, you have an eight pin IC here, you have uh, your whole processor here, all this in the right size of grains of sand assembled on a board, designed to perfection, and they work flawlessly in the hands of an expert. So, so electronics, what you study in textbooks, yes, it's true, things are changing. Things are becoming smaller, better, more secure, more faster, and the requirement for having such technology be able to reach your hands is now possible and anything and everything can be purchased over the internet and can be delivered right down to your house so i want you to understand is electronics is evolving don't take it for granted once you understand how each small component works you should you'll be able to appreciate people who design such technologies for example talking about a switch that you have on your switchboard there are three switches here push buttons so the size of those buttons have become smaller at the same time i'm still able to use my finger to operate them safely without damaging the components around it and you want to power it up the same cable that you used your for your phone can be used to plug it into it and you can communicate with this board program this board so and be able to communicate with the microsoft azure cloud which is an iot space or it's like a computer on the internet that i can control uh, through to control any appliance or even my entire house or even a server or anything over the internet so i don't have to be physically present at the location to be able to control it it's all possible with the advancements of electronics so that's it for now if you have any questions on how things have changed over the years or understanding the concepts of electronics feel free to drop me a message either on google classroom or on my email or on my number or call me anytime and i'll be able to answer those questions for you so that's it for now and uh, if i will try to do a recap video to help you understand it with more practical demonstrations in another session a little later. Thank you and have a great day.